Well, we couldn't be more excited to bring to you our next set of uh, presenters to help us understand why it's important to build a business case for watershed restoration. Mike Bernier is the Director of Sustainability for Swire Coca-Cola USA, which produces, sells, and distributes Coca-Cola and other beverage brands in 13 states across the American West. For more than a decade, Mike has led all aspects of the Sustainable Development Program for the 7,200 person, $2.5 billion bottler, including water stewardship, climate, and waste and packaging commitments. Joining Mike all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, is John Radke. John is the Water Sustainability Program Director for Coca-Cola North America. He manages the company's water stewardship program, which assesses and mitigates water risks facing Coca-Cola operations on local, regional, and national basis. Primary areas of focus include water efficiency initiatives and plants, source water protection strategies, community water partnerships, and sustainable agriculture initiatives within the supply chain. One goal of the company is to return to nature and to communities an amount of water equivalent to the water used in Coca-Cola's beverages and their production. Mr. Radke's leadership in these areas have helped position Coca-Cola as an industry leader in water stewardship. So please welcome Mike and John to the stage. And they might still be out in the hallway. They're having very good conversations. So um, yeah, Molly, will you go pop out and grab them? Well, I saw them buying Cokes from the soda machine. So they're all probably toasting. And, and Swire Coca-Cola has been an incredible partner of Club 20s, which may seem like an odd partnership, but with the regulatory environment around water, around single-use plastics. Uh, we've just had an incredible partnership with Coca-Cola and Swire Coca-Cola in particular. So please welcome Mike and John to the stage. We finally made it. <laughs> I told him you were drinking Coke. Oh, we do have some product placement here, so make sure the labels so face in the right way. So th this has been a very technical conference. So John and I kind of decided we'd sit up here and just kind of make it a bit conversational, um, to see two um, sustainability people that work in the business world and our perspective on that. So John, why don't you go ahead? Okay. So I'll start out first. Um, so I work for the Coca-Cola company. I'm going to assume everybody's somewhat familiar with our company. We we make beverages. Um, and they're pretty good, so you should try some. Um, I'm myself, I'm a hydrogeologist and a hydrologist. And a lot of people ask me, so what, what is a hydrogeologist doing working for the Coca-Cola company? And the answer is it's all about the water. So, you know, we make hundreds of different, different uh, products, but the number one ingredient in every one of them is water. So... Yeah, not sugar. That's a whole nother conference. This, this one is a water. <laughs> um, so, you know, so we use a lot of water in the product. Also, it's a big component of the agricultural ingredients that we use in our product. Um, and then just as important or maybe more important, it's the life-giving resource for the communities where we operate. You know, that's where our, our customers are, our consumers, even our employees. And so we realize you know, you have to have healthy, viable watersheds and water supplies to have an economically viable community. And that's what we need for our business. So, you know, we have a vested interest in making sure that um, our water supplies are secure. Um, there's also, you know, a reputational component to this. We get attacked all the time. Uh, any 
a lot of people, activists can make a name for themselves by attacking the Coca-Cola company. You know, we're this big iconic brand. So we have a target on our back. And so we have developed some, what I think are really strong water stewardship programs and strategies. Um, so we can be proactive and stay ahead of the game and not reactive to, to some of the activists out there. So, you know, from a company-wide standpoint, you know, water is super important and we'll get into a little bit what our strategies are and how we're dealing with it. But um, I wanna turn it over to you, Mike, and maybe you can share a little bit about the, uh, the bottler side of things. Yeah. Uh, but before you do that- yeah, I knew um, you weren't gonna let me talk. Yeah, I know. Before you do that, um, a lot of people don't really realize or understand how the Coca-Cola company is set up between the company and then the bottlers. You'll hear, hear us talk about bottler a lot. Um, so the Coca-Cola company owns the brand and the secret formulas, you know, and we make the concentrate that we then sell to our bottling partners who like, just like Swire is one of those, one of our key partners or one of our favorite partners. <laughs> um, and they're the ones who actually make the product, use most of the water um, and they're their own separate business, but they also share, share the Coca-Cola name. So Thanks over to you. Mike. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, John. Um, so yeah, John and I are, kind of have been partnering on water for a long time. Anything I've done, I've learned from John. So I've been with Swire Coca-Cola for 13 years, working on water stewardship, as well as climate uh, waste. Um, so first, who's Swire? So hold on one second. If I, get, if I get this description wrong, our communications director will kill me. He says, okay, we're at $2.5 billion in revenue, 7,200 employees across 13 states serving 30 million consumers <laughs> there. So anyways, short, we're a bottler for the Western half of the US minus California. We're also uh, part of a larger bottler that's Swire Coca-Cola based at the Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, and uh, about half of China. So we're a pretty large organization um, and I'm proud to be able to work for Swire. Um, we've been very progressive about water stewardship. Like John says, we're one of his favorite bottlers um, and we're your local community here. I mean, we, there was two people here that live here in Grand Junction. We, we're, when you see the Coke trucks going around, that's Swire family. Um, and we're excited to be here today. Um, and so we, the same things that John has shared about our values and why we invest in water is, is the same reason we do. Um, in addition to all of what he said, it's just a core, that's a core value for Swire. It's a 200 year old company. Um, I think the company plans on staying around another couple hundred years and would like the uh, environment to be healthy um, for us operating and us to live in. Um, so that's, that's about it from there. Let's switch to the next one. So, yeah. I think the topic of this is why, you know, how, making a business case for, case for water for water sustainability. And I think if you look at the slide up above, um, we do a thing called source vulnerability assessments. So we analyze our watersheds, we learn the risks, um, and they range from drought, um, climate, fire, infrastructure, um, regula regulation. Um, so if you pull this up and put it to, put it to the C-suite and start realizing the risk to our watershed and to our number one ingredient, it's a pretty easy case to make. I'm pretty fortunate I didn't have to make the case, but this is a case that's made. But then you go from there and say, okay, here are, here are the vulnerabilities um, in our watershed. And then how do you go about giving back and addressing those? So what we do is we partner with a, probably a lot of you in this room in a roundabout way. We, don't, we know how to make soda. We know how to sell soda. We don't necessarily know how to repair a watershed. What we can do is learn from a lot of smart people. I was listening to all you talk today and I realized, oh, these are the smart people in the room right now. Um, we work with the Nature Conservancy, Trout Unlimited, um, we recently gave a funding to a couple um, projects up there, Windy Gap, and what's the other one, John? Uh, there's one in Gunnison. Gunnison, uh, yeah. Yes. Um, we're going to get into some of the projects we've, we've both helped sponsor over the years. Um, so, I mean, when, when you so go on stepping back, when we get outside our doors, it's okay, how, how, do, we, how do we advocate for public policy? You see, Business for Water Stewardship over there, we're pretty close with them. When they need us to help advocate for policy, we're usually right there by their side. Um, so we do that. We work with the nonprofits, and it's a pretty exciting field to be in. And I get to dabble with some smart people. So, so it's 
it's interesting. Um, you know, as Mike said, Coca-Cola company and the bottlers, we know how to make beverages. We don't know that much about, you know, managing our water resources. But part of this source vulnerability assessment program, SVA program, we call it, includes training where we'll go around to all the bottling sites and teach the local team where their water comes from. And when you first go into the plant, typically, you know, you'll say, okay, where do you know where your water comes from? And they'll say, yeah, that pipe right there. Um, but then what we do is get them to look outside the four walls of the plant. Most of our water comes from municipalities, um, but then we go beyond that up into the watersheds and where they source their water. And so we try to build our strategy around that. Yeah. If you walk if you walk into any one of our facilities and ask the source water protection team, plant manager, they can tell you where their watershed is. They, they, they can tell you they, they, they can tell you the scarcity level. They can tell you whether they're at, in, in a drought right now. They can tell you the water quality. They, they, they've been trained on it. And they have to get retrained on it every five years. So every five years, we, we have to go back through another source vulnerability assessment where we hire hydrogeologists to come in, redo it, see what's changed, identify any risks that we weren't aware of before and start readdressing a plan. And part of that plan is public outreach. Um, that's a large part of our plan. So one last thing about the, um, the risk that we're looking at and how you make the business case. I work with a lot of other companies and Coke has been in the water stewardship business for, for a long time, for, you know, a decade and a half. Um, and we were, we've been leaders in this space. A lot of companies come and ask, okay, how do we set up our water strategy? And one of the first things they usually ask is how can we sell this to our C-suite to invest in this? You know, how do you show the value? Um, and it's hard for me to give a good answer to that because for Coca-Cola, the value is, all right, what do you do if you don't have water? We don't have a business, period. Um, and so, you know, you can get by. Packaging is a big deal now. You know, oh, people don't like plastic. Uh, okay, well, there's an alternative. You know, you can use aluminum or some other, other things. But um, if you don't have water, then we just don't have a business. So when you get to the bottom line, that's, that's the real business case for us. So John, um, I prompted up behind you, John, some... Uh, yeah, all right. So... Our strategy that we had developed over the years, and we just recently kind of re-upped our strategy out to 2030, um, is revolves around three main pillars. One is our operations, which mainly is um, controlled by our bottlers. That's the manufacturing plants where a lot of that water is used. Second pillar is around watersheds, and not just where we source our water for, for the beverages, but also where we source our ingredients. Um, so we have all those watersheds and we prioritize those ones we wanna double down in. And then the third pillar is around communities. A lot of that has to do with uh, water access, sanitation, hygiene, which is a big deal in parts of the world, Africa, parts of Asia and Latin America. Um, we are finding out that's also an issue here in the US. Um, the last research I saw says there's about 2 million people in the US that lack access to clean water, um, which is kind of surprising. So we do have some work to do in that space. But today, what we're going to focus on is more of the watershed piece and what we're doing to, to help su support watershed restoration. Um, so we set a big goal. Um, actually, we set it back around 2008 or nine, And that goal was to return to nature and communities all the water that we use in our beverages. And so you look at our sales volume, which we assume is 100% water, even though it's not. There's some sugar in there, as somebody called out before. <laughs> um, but we take that volume and then we do projects on the ground that we then translate those projects into water savings or putting water back into the watershed, recreating the natural hydrology of the systems. We found a way to quantify that. And then we balance that against our, our sales volume. We set a goal to achieve this 100% this replenish is what we call it by 2020. And we actually figured out how to do it. And we talked to our NGO partners and kind of they figured out what it is we're looking for and started bringing some good projects to us. And then we actually reached that goal five years early in 2015, replenishing all the water that we use. So we've continued it though, beyond that. Um, sometimes the projects get older and they sunset. And so we have to keep adding new projects. And hopefully our sales keep going up and our volume goes up. So we have to keep adding those volumes too. Um, and those projects come in all different shapes and sizes. They're, you know, anything from 
fixing uh, a water main, you know, infrastructure, gray infrastructure in a municipality, to uh, removing invasive species, to um, restoring wet meadows, which we've heard a lot about today. Um, there's all kinds of projects. If you look at that map behind me, you can see all those little green drops, inverted drops, are active replenish projects that we have going on right now. Um, there's over, there's like 85 of them um, just in North America. And North America to Coca-Cola is Canada and the US. Um, and we're replenishing 37 billion liters per year. Um, so originally, whenever we set that goal, we didn't have any parameters or constraints really around where we would do these projects. We tried to focus them where always where something is needed. And so we work with our partners on the ground, you know, the Nature Conservancy's uh, BEFs, and they would say, yeah, we got a big problem over here and we need some funding to do this project. And we would fund it, count the drops. Now we've developed a new 2030 water strategy where we're gonna focus on those areas that are the most in need, the most water stressed areas. So we call it context-based goals. So what you're gonna see, and on this map behind us too, you can see some watersheds. I just switched it. Oh, well, <laughs> what you saw before was some watersheds. Um, and we've identified which of our manufacturing plants are in those highest water stress areas. And that's where we're gonna be focusing. And if you look at a map of the US, you know we have some of those water stress plants in Florida, um, some in Texas, but mostly it's in the Western United States. Um, and so that's where our big focus is. And we started doing projects here in the Colorado River Basin recently, and those will step up a lot more. Mike, you I, wanna talk a little bit about you guys' specific projects? Yeah, and I, I did, that's why I just put up the Swire operating region. So that operating region in blue is where Swire operates. Um, and John mentioned that um, they've hit the 100% goal for all of North America. And together with John and Swire operating, operating regions, we're at 265% replenished in, in, in our regions. Okay, the number's correct up there. Um, so we're, we're at 265%. So we do almost all our projects with John and Coke North America. We jointly fund them. Um, working a lot with Forest Service, National Forest Foundation, Bonneville Environmental Foundation, Trout Unlimited. So uh, an array of groups that are, have the boots on the ground. Um, if you look at some of the more recent ones, um, we just funded two here on the Western um, Slope. Uh, we have another one in Utah we just did on the Provo River. And I'm, look, I'm looking, I can't quite remember the replenish volumes, but we're talking billions of liters a year. Um, Verde River in Arizona, um, which is, uh, that's an exciting one. Um, it's the, it's the Verde River is the direct source for our Tepe manufacturing plant. And there's been a lot of organizations, including us, that have put money into the Verde River, and we're replenishing there more than triple of what we're using in our in our manufacturing plant in Tempe, Arizona. Um, you get into we've done work in uh, Oregon on the Willamette River, and that's a lot about replenish. But there's also a lot of water quality there too. So I think we don't want to limit ourselves to to only um, water replenish, but also look at water quality. Um, so I'm pretty excited about what we've done on water. I think you can see up there, we're hitting 265%. And uh, we plan on keep on going. I'm, we're looking right now, John and I were just talking about, okay, where are we, where are we gonna scope out um, in this coming year? And we really wanna hit Colorado um, Basin. Um, that, that's, that's a vulnerable area along with Arizona. Um, so we're looking for a good idea. Someone was just here talking to us about a good idea out there, um, which was exciting. Um, yeah, so we've, you know, we have plants all over the West, well, all, all over the country. Um, part of that water strategy, strategy I was talking about, um, it includes identifying priority basins where we're gonna double down. And it might be where we have multiple um, high stress manufacturing locations. And originally we set those priority basins to be, we have one in Florida, most of Florida, we have one that basically circles all of California because their water is so interconnected. Um, then we have the Rio Grande and the Trinity River in Texas. And that's where we stopped at first. Um, and largely because of the criteria we use for identifying how we're gonna call a priority basin. Um, we have a plant in Denver, Swire does, and there's one in Phoenix. 
both which in a way can tap into the Colorado basin, you know, about transfer over to Denver water. Um, and now we've just opened a third plant in the Phoenix area, which does draw from the Colorado River. So I think I'm pretty confident we're gonna be naming the Colorado River as one of these priority basins. Now, what does that mean? Um, we're going to do replenish projects to replenish, first of all, all the water we use within that basin. And we're going to really start to drive collective action among industry groups. So I mentioned that we have a priority basin in, in uh, California. We founded a uh, group it's called the California Water Action Collaborative, or the acronym is QUAC, for, for good or for bad, it's QUAC. Um, and it's a, a group we started with a few companies and now we've recruited more and more companies to come in. I, and then we also have NGOs. So you have groups of NGOs and companies together who have this common goal of improving the water security in California. And so what we do is we identify where multiple companies might have an interest in a certain area. And then we have the NGOs tee up projects that we decide on and we say, okay, we're all gonna co-invest in this. And the idea is to scale up the impact. Um, you know, we as a company, we, we make our investments and in the big, the big picture, it's probably not all that much money. You know, we're not gonna really move the needle in a whole watershed. But whenever you start getting a bunch of companies together um, investing, then you can start making a difference. Then what the goal is eventually is to leverage even more money and start getting into the government funds. And a lot of times, two, two things happen. One, sometimes they need private funding match to, to get other funding to leverage that. And sometimes if the private sector and the economic drivers within that state say, this is important to us, this is where we're investing our money or OPEX, then the state says, oh, I guess if this is important to them, we better really allocate money towards that. And so I think, you know, the benefits of corporate involvement can go beyond just the dollars that we put in. Yeah. Um, we, we did just tee up a new quack, but in Texas, so we call it Texwac. Um, so that's, uh, so that's John, a what's the new. Colorado one going to be? So, yeah, that's the question. So if we name Colorado as a, uh, one of those basins, I, I guess it'd be Coac. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, we jumped right into, um, talking about outside our doors, but I would be a remiss if we didn't start talking about what we, where we started this journey and it was really inside our doors. Um, we had to first look at, okay, how are we using water? How are we valuing water? Um, and how do we reduce what we use? Um, so I think we've done a lot of effort on that. We continue to. Um, we've reduced over since you know, 2008, nine-ish, we've reduced in our water manufacturing plants about 25% with Swire. Um, we have a goal on what we measure, what's called water use ratio. So we measure it just like any production line efficiency that has to get addressed every month, reported to our parent company and explained any deviance, deviations from budget. Um, and so we, it's, it's liters of water per liters of product. So it's a balance of there. A perfect would be one. So we are starting to somewhere around a two about 2008. We're down around a 1.5, 1 1.6 now. We have a goal to be at 1.4 by 2030. And I think we can do it. Um, pretty certain we can. So I think I just wanna make sure we, everyone realizes we're working inside our own doors too. I, I, we're investing money in our equipment. We're investing money in our filtration systems and new technology. We have seed money coming in from our parent company in Hong Kong that help us work with innovation. So we're getting innovative inside our doors as well as outside our doors. And I think one other thing that um, I, I probably missed is working a lot with the municipalities, um, the water districts. And we had a, we recently had a meeting um, with Denver Water, um, really good meeting. Um, part of what we did was as the drought was ramping up, um, which it's never gone away. So, but as it was getting worse recently, we meet with every one of our water districts and we meet with them when we do an, a source vulnerability assessment. Um, and then we go back and remind them, hey, we're here. What can we do for you? How can we help you? Um, we're a partner, um, share with them what we're doing, what we're doing well, um, learn what they need from us. Um, there's been examples in, the, we have a plant in Fruitland, uh, Idaho, and years back um, there was a fire and they needed us to shut down and we did. They just needed the water supplies to small town. So they asked us to shut down, so we shut down. Um, another example of a close partnership would be in Wilsonville, um, Oregon. Um, they got a test on uh, an analogy, a mold. Um, the, the, the 
the water district did. It turned out to be a false positive, um, but they, call, they call, called us first. We shut down our facility, turned out to be a false, false positive, but it's the relationship is where I'm getting at there. Um, when you have a relationship with the municipality, you can work together um, and they can point you in right areas, um, where watersheds, where they're working. We were meeting with Denver Water and we started talking about a couple uh, projects that we helped fund a little bit on. Also, they said, hey, we do too. And we pulled up similar pictures of the same place at the same time. So I, 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 I think what I can't stress enough is with for Swire Coca-Cola is we're a local bottler, we're the community. John has, John has great strategic um, plans for the US. We're the ones on the ground right here. We're, we're, we're the community, um, so. So let's uh, talk just a minute about the actual projects, the individual projects. For, uh, usually we just talk in numbers, oh, 216%, 37 billion liters, but it's really, you know, the difference you're making on the ground. Um, so I've, I'm also an avid fly fisherman. And so these projects, a lot of times align really well with with the places I want to be. <laughs> I'm not saying that's how I make my decisions on which projects we're going to fund, but um, it doesn't hurt. Um, but no, part of my job is to actually go out to the projects and, and uh, you know, witness them and, and be able to verify that, yeah, it's, this was- It's a horrible job when I have to do it too. <laughs> this is done, uh, you know, the way it was supposed to be done. Um, shoot, I, and I was thinking about what are some of my favorite projects? Um, usually they are in the mountains. Uh, we heard this morning um, that the, the Forrester from uh, El Dorado in California. And we were doing work in that same watershed, uh, restoring wet meadows. And it's just, I love going up there to see those projects. Um, we did just start one in the Gunnison area, actually on the Taylor River last year with the US Forest Service, one of our biggest partners. Um, and I haven't gone to see that yet, so we need to get there. But Mike, I was wondering um, if you have any favorite projects. Well even though it's not in our operating region, is that one right up there, John? So that's above, that's Comanche Creek, is it not? Yeah. So that was Comanche Creek um, where it was uh, kind of a, the, the usual story where you have a dried up river, there's no wetland. I heard all of you talking about this today. Um, so it's a big project. Um, John really led the, led the team on that. Um, and what's fun about that is you see the before and after photos. When you see the before photos, you couldn't walk across the field. It was dirt. It was barren. The, the river was mud. Um, they were able to, John, did they use uh, the GTR 310 or GTR 373 technique on that? <laughs> Does anybody know what he's talking about? <laughs> we, we've actually spent too much time with the uh, foresters. Um, they were throwing out these, uh, these bulletins. I, I, I told him I was going to put him on the spot about that since he's a hydrogeologist. That so. would be more like a 373, you know, <laughs> the dispersed clump in space. But, but anyway, there's the before and after on that, um, which is really exciting. That That's one of my favorites that I actually got to see. Um, the Verde River is really exciting. I think it's really, you can really touch it. You can see the diversion gates going on. Um, another one would be, uh, I guess, be in Idaho. And they, that was a nature conservancy project that we gave a small amount to. That was you know, a canal um, that was kind of, you know, took, took, took it out of a canal irrigation and kind of, kind of recreated a wetland in the stream. So that was a favorite one. So I can just keep on going. Willamette River was fun going up and down the Willamette River and seeing the projects come to fruition on that. So what about you? Uh, well, I do love this this Comanche Creek project. And one of the coolest things about it is we, we, we did it in conjunction with the uh, US Forest Service and National Forest Foundation. Um, and we invited other companies up to go see the project um, and also some local legislatures. And um, we had videographers out there and everything. Our public affairs people want, wanted to make a big deal out of it and bloggers. Um, and so we brought them up there and we, after the visit, everybody saw how impactful it was and, and what a difference we were making that we got two other companies said that they were gonna start investing in it. And then the New Mexico uh, Fish and Wildlife was there too. The first time they saw the project and they said, wow, this is great. We're gonna use Pittman Robertson funds and leverage your private funds three to one. And then, so they said, okay, all of a sudden we got two more investors from corporations and then we pooled our money, Pittman Robertson, they said they're gonna match it three times. Pretty soon, the Forest Service said, wow, we got enough money to fix this whole watershed. Um, and so basically it's the first time I can remember where, all right, 
I think this one is going to be done. In fact, they're just finishing up maybe this year. Um, and we moved on to other watersheds now, knowing that that one was fixed. So it's a real success story in my mind. And they reintroduced a real grand cutthroat trout there because it was the habitat was pretty much destroyed and yeah. now it's restored. Yeah, and, that, and that's a theme that you know John and I were talking, okay, what, what theme can we come out of this discussion with? And it was, okay, we're doing good stuff in water. Other companies are doing good stuff in water. How do, how do we get everyone working together and, and making a bigger impact? And I, I think you know, we're trying, um, we're making good efforts on that. And I think if we all, everyone in this room working together can get corporations, government, um, NGOs um, aligned on specific projects, we can have a bigger impact. Um, I, I see a lot of good going on out there. I see a lot of corporations giving money, but if we pull together, we can do an even better job at it. Yep. Um, and I just wanted to answer one more project. You asked what my favorites were, and that was, that was one and probably more pertinent to this conversation. But one of my favorites is um, down in the Rio Grande in the Big Bend region. Uh, we we're doing invasive species removal, giant cane, um, but it's really hard to get to down there. And in order to go see the project, we had to get in canoes and um, go on a three day, what was it, four day, four day canoe trip through the canyons, thousand foot walls on each side, no cell phone service, no way to get out until you got down to the end of, other end of the cab canyon. You, you didn't invite me on that. And trip, that was, huh? and then we went with, um, uh, the people who were actually doing a lot of the work also happened to be outfitters. And so they went along with us and of course had their, the camp set up before we got there with margaritas made. And it was, uh, that's, that's when I said, sometimes I really like my job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, speaking of margaritas, uh, I think she just flagged that we have about 10 minutes left and then it's cocktail hour. So do we want to open up to any questions anyone might have? I have a question. So I'm Merritt Lenke. As of yesterday, I was the chair of Club 20, but today I'm the past chair of Club 20. My two years are up. I'm also a Grand County Commissioner, so I specifically appreciate the work that you had mentioned about Windy Gap. And in Windy Gap kind of fits in with, I think, philosophically, I'm hearing from you guys, healthy rivers, healthy fisheries lead to less treatment that you have to do the water that goes into Coca-Cola or any of the other products that you make. So thank you for that. And also thank you for your sponsoring of Club 20 and, and your work that you've done across the country. So I really don't have a question for sure. I just really wanted to show my appreciation. Thank you for your, you said you'd made a contribution to Windy Gap, but I also know that Pepsi, which is you guys' competition, correct? They, I, you're gonna they, throw down the gauntlet I, I, here, aren't you? Not really. <laughs> not really? <laughs> not really? Well, I all do know that the Colorado Sun reported that they just gave $2 million to that yeah, project. Yeah, so, yeah, they did. So um, thank you for your contribution also. And again, for being a sponsor at Club 20. And, and you know, on, on that note, I'm happy to see even people that are kind of think they're our competitors um, <laughs> give money. Um, that's exciting to see. Um, I, don't th I think a lot of times out in the landscape of the environment, we put aside that competition and I root each other on to do good things. So. And I would make, yeah, good. <laughs> uh, I would like to echo what Merritt said. It's fantastic to see a private, uh, well-known corporation at one of these water meetings. So thank you. Uh, I'm Lewis Meyer from Durango, Colorado. I'm not gonna ask you what your secret sauce formula is, <laughs> uh, but I might ask something close to that. Um, your water providers that you get some of your water from uh, at best have some challenges. At worst, it may be a crisis. The um, average cost of water that they're able to sell, and I used to do a lot of work for water providers and water rate studies, uh, is about an average of 2 to $3 per thousand gallons, some lower, some higher. And I compare that to the cost of what you can sell Dasani bottled water for. How can we educate our public, uh, brand our water, or uh, to really uh, have water rates reflect the true cost of water? Because it, it isn't. It's subsidized. 
Um, it was one of the major statements in Colorado Water Plan that people aren't paying for the true cost of water. What recommendation would you give to water providers to have rates that will allow you to continue to have good clean water? So I, I deal a lot with this issue. Um, you know, when we've done these SVAs, which we talked about all across the country, I've been to, yeah, a hundred different municipalities, tried to answer the same question. Um, one thing that I notice is if you need to detach the water department and rate decisions, detach that from like the city council, people who are elected, <laughs> you know, you need to get people in there who are making the decisions for the good of the system, not to keep rates low so they can get reelected. Um, I've noticed that's a, an issue sometimes. Also, if you had asked our plants or our company, you know, probably 10 years ago about, hey, you know, water costs this much, um, they're wanting to raise the rates to this much, you know, you're a big water provider, what do you think? And we would have said, no way, you know, we need to keep our rates low, that's a huge expense for us. Now we're figuring out that you have to have good infrastructure, good water treatment, there's getting more pressures on it, that we are starting to come around to saying, yeah, there is a true cost of water and the rates should be higher. And we want to pay our fair share of those rates. You know, we don't want to pay more or less than anybody else, but we understand that it's not just the cost to, you know, get pump water to you. You have to protect the watersheds. You have to replace your water mains regularly. Don't wait till they all start breaking down. Um, and so, you know, I, I agree with you. I think we need to get somehow raise awareness among people that, you know, raising water rates isn't necessarily that, that bad, unless you have affordability issues. And some people, you know, you can't have them pay a certain, over a certain percentage, I think, of their total income on water. But um, other than that, you know, I think um, we, I think our water is way too cheap. <laughs> it's much more valuable than we give it credit for. Um, and I don't know if that answered your question or if you have anything else to yeah, add. I, I think there would be a perception to John's point that we would be fighting against water prices going up. I had a conversation with a woman that was the head of the utility districts in one region we operated. And she was a friend of a friend and she was, and she's going, she was, had a plan to incrementally raise the prices. And she's, she's kind of feeling me out saying, what do you think? I said, I think it's what needs to happen. I mean, I, we need reliable water source. We need re reliable water supplies. Um, we also need wastewater. Um, we need to be able to treat wastewater too. So I think we need to look at the whole cycle on water um, coming in and out. So I concur with what John's saying. And I concur with what you say of it's underpriced. Um, yesterday, uh, my name is Chris Trees. I, I'm on the board at Club 20. And yesterday in the board meeting, I confessed that I'm easily confused. I had ready, uh, ready nods of agreement from all my fellow uh, board colleagues. I'm going to declare it again today with my question. You've talked about restoring, replacing, replenishing at least the quantity of water that you're consuming and bottling. Where's that water coming from that you're replacing your use with? How is there a net gain or even a zero sum calculation? John, so, I, I answer this a lot, but I'd love to hear you answer it. <laughs> but, so we don't, we don't create water, you know, we don't do cloud seeding or anything like that. What we do is restore, typically we'll restore the natural hydrology and improve, you know, storage or whatever is needed in the watershed. So you look at what the challenge is, um, and then we try to address that local challenge. We're not necessarily creating new water, but for instance, like whenever you restore a, a wet meadow, you know, that before had incised streams and it had dried out. And then whenever, you know, the snowpack melts, it all just rushes out and leaves, leaves that uh, meadow. And, you know, they may dump it downstream whenever they're emptying the reservoirs or who knows what. Now it acts as a big sponge after you fix it and it's storing that water and it releases cool, clean water even during the driest periods. So you have the water available then whenever you do need it. Um, and so it's maybe changing the, the timing, 
you know, of when the water is available. It may be, um, in some cases, you are creating water if you're removing invasive species um, that are extra thirsty. Um, and then in some cases, you might be changing a hydrograph that's actually beneficial to habitat. So you're improving biodiversity, saving species. And so it's just trying to make the water more, more beneficial and restored back to its natural hydrology. That's so it. how do you calculate that benefit? Oh, you, so, I understand the okay. projects and programs, you've retimed it for the benefit of the environment, but I'm still working on okay. coming up with a zero sum game. So we initially, when we first had this idea of, well, you know, people a long time ago, and I say a long time ago, this is going back to 2007 or eight, whenever we first came up with this concept, <laughs> um, people knew about, like carbon neutrality, that was a thing. And then we came up with the idea of what about water neutrality? Is that possibility? And we said, well, maybe we could try it. So we worked specifically with the Nature Conservancy um, to come up with ways to calculate and translate these restoration projects into gallons of water. And since, so we adopted that protocol, that process. And then since then, we've had a uh, other companies and NGOs come in, verify it. And now there's something called the volumetric water benefit accounting tool that's publicly available. Everybody can have access to it. And it, it's, that's how you calculate these volumes of water depending on what type of intervention that you do. So it's just like a, a industry recognized um, methodology now. Anybody else have a question? We have one here in near the front. Hi, I'm Kirsten Neff. I'm with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, I'd like to hear about how you guys identify these projects. Are they sort of like ready to go when you come in or are you helping to develop them as well? Let me, let me start with that one. My first call is to John. Um, I say, what do you have going in, um, in Colorado? But then, but then, I mean, in reality, is we work with some primary organizations. Um, we were talking with someone about that today, uh, the National Forest Foundation (BEF), and they kind of know what we're looking for, and we'll we'll talk with them um, and say, okay, what do you have going? Like recently, we said, what, what do we have going in Colorado? This was last year, and they presented, came back, presented the two projects that we just recently uh, funded. Um, here's two projects going on. They have a, they're pretty good at giving us an estimate on what the replenish volume will be. Here, here are all the benefits of this project. Um, so they, so the answer the short answer is shorter is we ask people to bring them to us, um, to specific organizations. And then it's the process has evolved a bit. It used to be, I, I call it like chasing drops or chasing gallons, you know. And we would say, oh, we need a project that'll get us this many million gallons. And then we'd ask our NGO partners to, to bring that to us. Now we're understanding the really hotspot areas where we need projects. We'll go to our partners and say, do you have anything here? Sometimes they'll have projects that are teed up, all the permitting's done, and it's just a matter of implementation. And they're great. And then we can get our replenished volumes you know, by supporting that. Um, but now we're finding out more and more, especially since there's a lot of competition, which is good from other companies looking for those same projects. Um, we're starting to look further out. So we're not requiring, you know, this replenish volume and project completion within that year. We're saying, all right, we understand it might take a couple of years for this process to play out. Um, and so that's, that's probably the majority of our projects now are like two or two or even three years down the road that we fund up front. Uh um, my name is Paula Stepp. Um, I'm from Glenwood Springs. Um, I spoke earlier from the watershed council perspective, but also as a city councilor. And some of my conversations lately have been, how do we save water for our communities? And so there's a lot of talk of replacing bluegrass with native species and zero scaping efforts and community projects and getting people engaged in that thought of not watering as much. Are you doing any projects along that line that doesn't really replenish, but at least holds on to what we have? I, I would say how we're advocating along those lines is through our community donations um, and groups who are, who are advocating for that. Um, so we have our own community giving fund as we have a project fund, which is for bigger projects like that. 
and we have a community CSR fund. So we'll have a lot of organizations that fall into that in, into that realm and we'll donate to them. Um, they know they know how to do the job and we know how to help support them. And we are we're we're trying to put pressure on our bottlers, at least where they have facilities and you know where they might have their own grass and, and stuff and try to get them to zero escape. Um, it's it's kind of a constant battle, but we are trying to push that. Well, well, also, well, 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 we're not one of them. No, you guys, yeah, <laughs> you do great. Um, we're also right now I'm considering uh, uh, funding a project that was brought forth by the Nature Conservancy to work with new developments um, to make them uh, basically zero, well, not, not require irrigation, you know, so it's everything from rain gardens to uh, just vegetation that'll grow in the natural conditions. So yeah, we're, I, yeah, I agree with you. We spend way too much of our water budget on watering mm -hmm. lawns. And, and, and you know what's interesting, and we've built buildings around the West is, and I've run across occasions where we're required to put in grass. Um, and I'll fight it and fight it and fight it. And it turns, I've, I've lost two of those battles and we're required to turn in grass because of city ordinances or industrial park HOAs. Um, so I think everyone in this room that has some influence, that'd be a good area to influence there to stop that requirement. And then our final question will come from Zoom. Um, and it's Juan Madrid from Green Latinos. And he says, yes, water is underpriced, but at the same time, we have disproportionately impacted communities that currently cannot afford current water rates and have been threatened with water shutoffs, or in some case, actually shut off. So how do you do, how do you balance that with your comment of water not being valued at its current value? I think that's a good point. I mean, Jim, and uh, that's, that kind of gets into um, you know, environmental equity. Um, and we're going to have to address that. I mean, I've, I was asked recently at a conference like this about environmental equity, I guess it was a couple of years ago, pre-COVID. Um, and we jumped in and started realizing, all right, we, we're, not look, we're not looking at this in the right way always. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I have the answer to that, but that definitely ha should be a consideration um, when talking about water pricing. And it, it's a, yeah, a big issue. I mean, that's really like the root of what happened in uh, Flint, Michigan. You know, they were being priced out of their, their water. And so they switched over to a new water supply that was cheaper. And then look what happened. Um, you know, we talked about, well, I was talking about not having, not paying a certain, over a certain percentage of your income on water. Um, you know, we need to figure out some sort of policies around that because water's cheap for a lot of people and yet it's too expensive for others. There's gotta be a way to share some of that, that cost across broader areas. And I always say, let's not look at just, you know, municipal, municipality by municipality. We should be looking at, you know, whole watersheds and, and bringing all this, you know, all, all the users and whether it's the wastewater or the water users together and let's make sure that water is clean, you know, secure and affordable, you know, across the whole watershed. But John I, and Mike, do you have tough. any <laughs> concluding remarks before we um, end this portion of our event? Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for for uh, asking us to come here and share share our experiences. Um, I, I would just say, I want you guys to know that we're here, the, the corporate world is more and more interested in water sustainability. And, you know, we don't have all the money to, to fix all the problems, but we do have a role to play. And, you know, I would, we want to be your partner. I'll just say thank you to Club 20 for having us here, allowing us to swire Coca-Cola to share our story and the work we're doing um, as your local bottler. Um, we're proud to be able to invest in our communities. Let's give a round of applause for Mike and John.